<clears throat> Hello, everyone. I'm Calypso Nicolaitis, Professor of International Relations from the other end of this campus. For those of you who spend your wonderful life in this wonderful place and never go elsewhere in Oxford. Uh, but here we are together today to celebrate and discuss and give a hard time to a wonderful new book uh, just published called Beyond Gridlock. Uh, and we're very, very lucky to have with us the main one of the two editors of this book, uh, Thomas Hale, who I think uh, everyone in this school knows very well. Uh, since Tom has worked, as you all know, both on issues of global governance, but also uh, on the environment. He's also an activist and not only an intellectual, I say only, there's nothing wrong with being a scholar, but you know, he also acts in the real world. And in the, this is true for our whole panel today, uh, who's here to discuss uh, the book Beyond Gridlock. Um, and of course, the panel has speakers who are from the school, starting with Emily Jones. Professor Jones is also well known to all of you in this school. She has worked both uh, indeed on issues of trade and global governance, very much on trade and developing countries, worried about asymmetries of power in the world, negotiation strategy for the weakest. And in that kind of state of mind, I think it's fair to say, Emily, that you've also been an activist in helping the cause of developing countries in many different ways, which I'm sure are gonna come back uh, in the debate today. Um, and then we have uh, Lucas Kello. Lucas is one of the authors of this, in this book. This book is an edited volume, but as the um, editors uh, point out very well, it's not any old edited volumes with chapters one after another. It's really an, an integrated whole, as we're going to discuss in a moment. And Lucas uh, is here at Oxford as the director of the Center on Technology and Global Affairs. Uh, very much involved in cyber issues, has just published a book on virtual weapons, but I haven't cited all of your other books, so I'm not going to go through this. But anyway, Lucas um, is joining us from the uh, DPIR to my colleague at DPIR. And we have, we are very, very uh, lucky to have with us two of your global fellows, global leaders. There are indeed global leaders, both of them. Uh, we have Folasha de Sule Kondu, did I pronounce your name right? Who um, uh, is indeed, um, um, has done a PhD at Sciences Po, which was also my alma mater, you know, from a long time ago, 2014. But I noticed that in your, um, in your uh, very um, important bios, not only are you lecturer in political science uh, in Benin at the University of Aborni Kalavi, but you also coordinate a whole big program at the LSE on uh, revisiting African agency in global politics, in, which seems to be a consortium. Maybe you'll say something more about it, but that sounds very, very inspiring. And then we have um, our last speaker is Maria Gwyn, who's also a global leader fellow, who has a PhD in law, no, a mass. Uh, not a PhD, yes, a PhD in law in here from Oxford University and uh, works on research in international law, finance, and many other issues, has been a wonderful citizen of this university for a long time. So you have a magnificent panel to discuss a book which I just want to say, I'm not going to say much to start with, but simply to say that, you know, these authors are very clever because what did they do? they hit on a, on a really good trick to have a stream of publication. First, they brought you a few years ago to Armageddon. The world is a real mess. Nuclear stuff, climate change, finance, e epidemic uh, problems, you name it. You know, our world is not doing well, is it? Is it? Not doing well. So they wrote a book called Gridlock Tom did uh, with, uh, with David Held and Kevin Young, and it was a wonderful book in terms of the research and the argument and very well laid out, but you know, really depressing. <laughs> Basically saying, we have Armageddon and we are not able to do anything about it, really, because there is gridlock in the global governance system for the very reason that helped globalization in the first place. So you come out of this book, you're very depressed, but lo and behold, Two or three years later, 
after having met with their authors, having gathered an amazing group of scholars to, to, to work together and to ask, well, how do we move beyond gridlock? There is some light at the end of the tunnel. Don't be too depressed. There are pathways, there are dynamics, there are things that can be done. There is agency in the system. And that's basically what they set out to do in the new book, Beyond Gridlock, basically to say, you know, we, are, um, we, we have a sense of compensatory justice, reparation for your poor, having depressed our poor readers in the first place. So this is why we're here today to discuss this book, to discuss the ideas uh, in Beyond Gridlock, and I'm now going to turn to Tom, who is going to give you a bit of a, an aperçu of the book, um, and then each of our panelists will say something about their issue area that they're most familiar with, then we'll engage in a bit of cross-cutting conversation among our speakers, and then we'll open for Q&A in about 45 minutes. Does that work for everyone? Great. So, there we go. Tom. Thank you. Thank you, Clipso, for that fantastic introduction. And uh, you've also given away the secret of the publishing strategy, which is, um, you know, uh, the only other thing to add is that the logical conclusion of any publishing strategy is to go in threes. And so a fear, though, if we look around the world today, is that the third, if there were to be a third book in this series, it would be called maybe Return to Gridlock. Um, <laughs> Because, and we hint at that in the conclusion. Indeed. <laughs> because if we look around the world today in the news any given day this week or last week or probably next week, um, it's easy to become quite depressed about the state of world politics. And I think it's probably no, no exaggeration to say that we are in many ways in this year, in this week, in this time we're living in and it's something of a crossroads in world politics for two major reasons. One something that sometimes is called the post-war liberal order seems to be in question. The institutional arrangements that have structured world politics for 70 years are now more than ever at any other time in that period open to question and revision. And secondly, and related, the politics in so many countries around the world are going through a time of great change and challenge. And some people um, worry about uh, the end of the kind of traditional post-war democratic welfare state as as, as a kind of um, principal ordering device of world politics. So we face a kind of twin crisis of international political order and domestic political order and all kinds of things. And the question is, what, how do we get here and what can we do about it? So gridlock and beyond gridlock are our attempt to think about those big problems that I think are reason many of us are here today to try to think through. Um, and I think there is some hope at the end of the tunnel, but it, it's, some, it's also some more steps we've taken. So gridlock really came out of the recognition that the challenges we were seeing at that time were more linked than was commonly agreed or commonly seen in the academic literature and the policy discourse. Um, Kevin and David and I would go to many lectures at places like this around the world on climate change, it was in the aftermath of the Copenhagen uh, summit, or on trade, it was in one of the downturns of the Doha round, or in any given issue area. And Experts would say why progress was so hard in each of these areas. Um, but the explanations for each of those were often contained to that issue area. So climate was hard because of climate change. Uh, trade was hard because trade was hard. And nuclear proliferation was difficult for that reason. Um, we, we tend to speak in these silos. And so gridlock really came out as an attempt to try to explain um, this phenomenon more structurally and more comparatively across a number of different issue areas. Um, and our argument basically boiled down to a kind of uh, um, unintended consequences of success argument. We said that the system set up in the, in the aftermath of World War II, or the so-called post-war liberal order, um, had succeeded in, inter in managing globalization to the extent that globalization could extend and continue. Um, and that it created a kind of virtuous cycle, if you want, of growing interdependence. So places, things as the economy expanded, um, people, once distant people and places became more interlinked. Um, and a, 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 a following kind of institutionalization to manage that interdependence. And as you have more of one, you need more of the other. But as you have more of the other, you get more of the other. And you have this sort of self-reinforcing interdependence institutionalization cycle. That allowed interdependence to deepen so much, though, that it changed the nature of many of the problems that we faced. Um, and gridlock was about four sort of trends that come out of that rising multipolarity, which of course is a good thing in terms of development. More people have more access to more things and have more of a say in world affairs than ever before. That's certainly a good thing. 
but it also means that it's harder to come to agreement on things because more and more diverse people have to agree for a global solution to be found. Or things like the, the changing nature of international problems, so as trade became less about uh, border, border, things that happen at the border, like tariffs or quotas, and more about things that happen in people's lives, like health standards or regulatory competition or intellectual property, then it's, of course, harder to agree. These are more difficult, complex issues. Um, and as the system gets locked in place for inertia and begins to fragment, these kind of trends um, are magnified. So gridlock was about trying to explain that across different areas. And as Calypso said, we really theorized ourselves into a very depressing place because each of these structural trends seems so pervasive and so widespread and so difficult to do anything about that we ended up depressing a lot of people and ourselves included. But we weren't satisfied with that analysis for two reasons. One, intellectually, as social scientists, we saw a number of exceptions to these ideas. Even though we saw it everywhere, there were exceptions. And those kinds of exceptions have to be considered by any Anyone here doing their doctorate work or thinking about these things will know. If you are, have a theory and you see some empirical exceptions to it, that is an invitation, indeed a, a commandment, to revise that theory or think about how the theory might want to be revised. But secondly, and maybe even more importantly, as not intellectuals but as citizens, people have to live in this world, um, we weren't norm normatively satisfied with, satisfied with an analysis that said, structure says you can't do anything. And world so what did you do about it? So, that's, so we did what people uh, always should do when you're front, confronted by a difficult problem, which is ask some smarter people what to do. <laughs> and so um, we, we uh, assembled what I uh, will modestly refer to as a really great cast of characters, people who um, are real experts in many, many subjects um, in world politics and are also interested in thinking comparatively about them. And we brought those people together um, a few times to talk through this issue without any plan for writing a book, really just as a thought exercise. Um, and, uh, and I'm delighted to see that you know, Lucas was one of them and is here today, um, and the others are listed on the book, and so please check it out. You'll, you'll see them there. We, won't, we weren't told during the early conversations that this was going to become a book project. By the time we found out, it was too late to get it. Yes. <laughs> it's a classic. So maybe they were not that project. smart. <laughs> Indeed. They were smart, but not you know, tactical. <laughs> So um, we managed to, to, to trick them into writing this book, um, and I'm really glad that we did because we found really two things. First, that yes, gridlock is pervasive across these 11 different areas we look at in the book, uh, climate, cybersecurity, nuclear proliferation, um, human rights, migration, health, a whole bunch of others, um, but also that there are pathways through it, and indeed systematic pathways through it. Um, and I don't want to take too much time to talk about all of them now because there are seven pathways in the book and we would be here for a while if we went through each in detail. But let me just mention the kind of uh, general categories into which they fall. And there are three of those. Um, agency, uh, resilience, and adaptation. Let me start with resilience. So in many areas of world politics, things are act international institutions have been created that are fairly robust and are actually a bit insulated or protected or strong in the face of the kind of the political um, gridlock that we identified before. Um, and indeed, some of them are, are able to, on their own, come up with solutions outside of the realm of kind of interstate negotiations and agreement. And this comes through, for example, in the trade chapter. And Emily's going to talk about this in a second. But um, what we saw in, uh, in the study was that um, things like the WTO's dispute settlement mechanism are these quasi-judicial functions that don't require state agreement in order to come up with new solutions. Because it's a kind of quasi-legal thing, law has this generative quality to take cases and create solutions, adapting, drawing on things that weren't written down in treaties in the first place. And so the inability of the trade world to come up with new agreements doesn't necessarily preclude the trade infrastructure from coming up with solutions to problems when they arise through this quasi-judicial mechanism. Or if we turn our attention away from the WTO to all the other parts of the international trade regime that really matter for maintaining a global economy, things like regulatory standard setting, uh, export credit agreements, um, commercial dispute resolution, we see a lot of technocratic organizations that are operating below the level of, world, of high politics but are super important for, for the outcomes that we all care about. And here again, there's, there's an insulation. So there's a lot more resilience in world politics than you might first think if you look at uh, the headlines. Secondly, there's a lot of innovation and adaptation, um, which is for me the most exciting part about all this. Um, international organizations have not been stuck in, not all of them have been stuck in place since 1945. There's been a lot of changes. And I think we see that it's really clearly in a realm that I work on a lot, which is climate change. 
So after over 20 years of negotiations, uh, countries didn't come up with very much in terms of global mitigation of climate change. But then on the 21st time, they came up with quite a new way of approaching the problem, which we now call the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. Um, and this really turned the kind of traditional cooperation problem on its head, and we try to talk about that in the book. Um, but we're seeing uh, some systematic pathways in that realm which apply in other areas as well. Um, so, for example, the Paris Agreement is great in that it outlines a common goal that we're all trying to work toward, but mobilizes a much more diverse array of diverse actors toward that goal, um, including cities and businesses and investors and civil society groups um, and others, and, of course, countries alongside them. Um, Tom is very modest, so he won't say that he's been one of the key coordinator of this fourth pillar, the bottom-up contribution to mitigating climate change, and that's occupied a lot of your time. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> um, but the, the interesting part for the, our book is that this model is actually seen in areas in global health, um, arguably in some parts of the trade realm too, um, in the human rights realm, and so this idea that you don't need to have um, a, a kind of binding uh, universal agreement to have progress is, is interesting. It puts, sort of turns on its head one of the arguments in, in the gridlock book about how fragmentation was a bad thing for cooperation. When, when our argument here is that fragmentation, when channeled and appropriately through the appropriate arrangements, can be a good thing. Um, and the, the last area that we wanted to focus on as a kind of set of pathways through and even beyond gridlock is on the agency of international actors and indeed of all of us in this problem. You know, gridlock is a very structural argument. It's about how history and trends have constrained the political space for cooperation. And that's all true. But agency uh, structure is, of course, only one half of the nature of social reality. There's also what we do with the things that have been done to us, which is one way to think about agency. Um, and we see this all um, throughout the book, um, of how different kinds of actors, precisely because of gridlock, precisely because structural forces have constrained them in some way, then react against it. Um, and an interesting example of this we see in the, um, in the realm of uh, global health in the uh, Ebola outbreak a few years ago. So Ebola, the outbreak was in some ways a quintessential case of gridlock. The World Health Organization was tasked with monitoring such things, um, had it underfunded and didn't have the capacity and some of the bureaucratic issues within it um, prevented an early identification and robust response through the kind of existing mechanisms. And so we saw this outbreak in West Africa that got worse and worse. Um, but once it reached a certain point, it motivated two kinds of agency. One, um, a huge response by civil society, and particularly Maison Sans Frontier was really out in front on this issue, um, getting in there, um, identifying new ways to make progress. And two, big powers changed their interests. So once the crisis reached a level where it was threatening um, other parts of the world, really, really spreading, threatening to spread internationally. We saw the Obama administration and others act very quickly to mobilize huge assets in a very short period of time. Um, and that kind of great power reaction against over um, uh, the negative consequences of gridlock is seen in other areas too. So to bring it to a close, the, the main uh, idea is, is that yes, gridlock is pervasive. Yes, we do face these structural barriers to cooperation. And yes, they are undermining uh, are kind of tools to manage interdependence right when we need them most. But at the same time, there are pathways through and beyond gridlock, and through resilience, through adaptation, and through agency, and we can work with those, and we can do something more with them. We don't have silver bullets, but we have pathways, and that's a, you know, maybe a slightly more nuanced optimism than we would come to in the past, but one we'll take for now. Well, thanks, Tom, and I, I think it will be very interesting in the Q&A to hear you all if you have examples that illustrate these pathways or even come up with other kinds of path pathways beyond resilience, innovation, agency, if you can think of other ways in which we move beyond gridlock. And I think it's also fair to say that in the book, they have this distinction between you know, small step, incremental ways to do this, they call it moving through gridlock, versus the title of the book, Beyond Gridlock, transformative, really big bang kind of things. Um, and it would be perhaps interesting to ask well, how we go from one to the other. But before we do that, let me first start, turn to Lucas. Uh, in, in some ways, um, cybersecurity, you know, in social science, we would say maybe that's the hard case because after all, it's the newest area calling for global cooperation and global governance. And it's a very hard one where there's a lot of uncertainty and complexity. So Lucas, have you observed gridlock and pathways through gridlock in cyber? 
Uh, yes, certainly. And I mean, let, let, let me say that I have a problem. And ah. Tom, you have a problem because I've only just realized that my chapter more appropriately belongs in your next book, <laughs> not this one. Oops. <laughs> so, because in answer to your question, Calypso, I think there's an intense degree of gridlock when it comes to global governance of uh, problems in the cyber domain. Uh, possibly a greater degree of gridlock and larger obstacles to overcoming it than in any other domain explored in the book. Uh, I suppose we could open up that comparative element to, to wider discussion. Uh, but I do think that there's uh, in, intense and persistent uh, gridlock at the global level. And so let me identify what I consider to be some of the main uh, sources of gridlock and obstacles to overcoming uh, it. So the first one, I think, has to do with the wide divergence of preferences amongst the main players. And so here I'm thinking of the United States, Britain, Russia, China. Because in the West, when we think about the uh, priorities of cybersecurity, we tend to prioritize uh, the preservation of the machine functions upon which our uh, economic systems and uh, governmental systems, even military systems, rely. Right? Um, and we're in, intensely aware about, of the uh, dependence that we have as societies and as governments on that proper functioning of the vital infrastructures. But when you talk to the Chinese or the Russians, they're also concerned, of course, about uh, preserving the functionality of their computer systems. But their primary concern is what they regard to uh, as uh, information security. So not the technical version of information security. So computer scientists will have, this is an old uh, term in computer science, and for them it will be the protection of data uh, integrity in a machine. But for the Russians, the Chinese, and other autocratic uh, uh, governments, their primary concern is uh, information security in, in the sense of protecting or controlling the flows of domestic information uh, through the Internet. Right? And that represents a major right, disagreement on the top priorities right, uh, for cybersecurity at the uh, highest table of international politics. And what that means is that you've got a scope problem because in, in the West, we want to come up with international treaties uh, to prevent certain kinds of offensive cyber activity uh, to protect our uh, computer infrastructures and so forth. And uh, in uh, those other parts of the world, you see that the priorities are different and there isn't much of an interest right, in trying to achieve such a treaty structure. Uh, Secondly, there's enormous disagreement on basic rules and norms of conduct in this domain. Again, amongst those main players. It's true, and here's, here's a glimpse of optimism. Uh, listen up, because you won't get much of it. Uh, there is some uh, basic agreement on red lines of action. So we haven't yet seen a true act of cyber war. That's a term, if you Google it, you'll see the term cyber war referred to just about any kind of activity in the, in the media or in the public perception. But a true act of cyber war, so a, uh, a cyber attack whose consequences in terms of physical destruction and loss of life rises to the level of a uh, traditional act of war. We haven't seen it yet. That's not because the technology to conduct such an attack doesn't exist. It does exist and has existed for a while. But there is a basic understanding consensus uh, amongst the main players, right, that, such, that a, the red line <coughs> of cyber war should not be crossed except, right, in a case of a real war. Uh, but there's very little disagreement on uh, harmful activity that falls below the threshold of recognizable war. And so this is one of the great novelties and problems of governance in this domain, because you have a growing uh, 
middle spectrum of action. I label it unpeace. Right? So between these traditionally binary notions of peaceful activity and wartime activity, right? you have activity that can be hugely harmful to our economies, to our political systems, right? and yet there's no firing of a single gun. But nor is it peaceful activity in the traditional sense that it's uh, generally tolerable. And there are few right, rules um, according to which you can guide such behavior. Right? So, um, so that's a, a second major <coughs> problem. A third one, I think, involves the uh, institutional uh, framework of, the, uh, of international politics. There's only one international treaty governing um, activity in this domain, and it's the Council of Europe Convention on Cybercrime from 2004. Uh, there's a reason why it's the only one, and that's because it deals with uh, action at the uh, low end of the spectrum. So basic criminal activity like uh, credit card fraud, child pornography, that kind of a activity uh, which governments, the large governments, can agree should be pretty much universally right, controlled. What the convention does not encompass is state-level, strategically driven activity, right? which is the more important kind of activity from a national or international security standpoint. Right? And so we haven't seen a new treaty emerge despite various attempts to create one um, precisely because of those differences in priorities and preferences uh, that I mentioned. Uh, just this year, the, there was a, the fifth round of the UN government, uh, governmental experts right, uh, discussions on, the, uh, on rules of conduct in in cyberspace, and it failed. It failed on the question precisely of how to apply uh, UN Charter principles right, to this domain. So there was a previous agreement that, yes, the UN Charter principles applied. You'd imagine they'd arrive at that conclusion quickly, but it took, it took a number of years to arrive at that simple conclusion, and yet now right, uh, the players can't agree on how exactly to apply. And a uh, final uh, source of uh, difficulty for governance, I think. It has to do with the fact that you're dealing with uh, relevant players that are not your traditional state players. Right? So it's, I mean, it's almost inconceivable that you would have a effective or complete governance framework for uh, major hacking incidents or uh, online influence operations such as we saw Right, during the U.S. presidential election last year, during the Brexit referendum in this country, without involving, right, in that governance framework, the big technology companies such as Facebook and Twitter. The problem, of course, is that these are players who have a different uh, preference structure than uh, nation states do. Right? They're private actors. They're after the private good and not the public good, and we saw not long ago what happens when uh, the private good and the public good are clashing, right? So in the case of the Apple FBI uh, contention, right? So this was the, after the uh, 2015 San Bernardino uh, terrorist attack in California, the uh, U.S. government presented a warrant to uh, Apple to unlock the terrorist uh, uh, iPhone, and Apple refused, saying that if, if they did that, then they would undermine the privacy regime right, of, the, uh, of the whole Apple ecosystem. And you had, for a moment at least, a private multinational company dictating to the largest government in the world which of two competing goods should prevail. Right. So that's, that's, I think, illustrative of the uh, uh, very deep problem of how to integrate right, these very different uh, 
players from an international relations perspective into the global governance framework. Well, thank you, Lucas, because you've made it very clear that uh, the challenge is great. Um, note this term, unpeace. You've heard it here first, uh, which is a, a term that Lucas, a concept that Lucas has been developing, and is very interesting because it gives us the measure of this amorphous challenge. And perhaps later we can kind of push you more on this one of the pathways being innovations. And of course, this is a field where innovation is called for and possible, and yet is not really used to make global governance you know, better. Now let's turn to a more traditional field, uh, trade, Emily, and perhaps you can tell us where you think uh, pathways to beyond gridlock. We, do we see them in trade? After all, Doha Round, stalemate, mega regional stalemate, Trump is building trade walls and all yeah. the rest of it. Uh, you were not the author of the trade chapter in the book, but this is your your area. Tell us what yeah. you think. Thank you very much, Calypso. Um, so I wanted to come back, actually, to the question of gridlock. Do we actually really see it in trade negotiations? And actually ask ourselves, is it a bad thing if we do? Okay, because I think implicit through the book, and I very much enjoyed reading it, and I enjoyed reading the, the trade chapter. But I really had this question of, is, it, is no deal always a, a bad thing, right? Because if not, we're always thinking going forward to more deals, right? But who gains from those deals? Let's put that question on the table. Um, and I think the idea that we need more cooperation and we're not having enough of it is certainly true in some areas. And the financial regulation chapter is a really interesting one to make that point very powerfully. Um, the trade one, I'd like to take on um, a few of the sort of core contentions there. Um, so the trade chapter um, highlights how we've seen a lot of cooperation in trade since World War One, sorry, World War II, um, a decline in tariff, an increase in trade, um, and then points out, of course, we've had the stalled uh, Doha. Um, round. And there's a really interesting analysis about agencies like the Bern uh, Union, which we really don't know much about, but are these sort of technocratic organizations that are doing quite a lot of work at the margins to facilitate trade. Um, so I really found that section of the, the chapter really interesting and very important. Um, but there, I kept coming back to this question of, well, do, would more trade agreements really be sort of a good thing? Um, and is the stasis and the, the paralysis in the WTO a bad thing? Right? Um, and sort of, I'm going to over-egg the pudding a little bit, but just to just sort of make the point here. And I think the, st the stalling of the Doha round in many ways um, was, is because we've seen um, developing countries have much more power in the global trading system. And actually, the agency to sort of block and resist issue, er in issue areas and where, in sort of areas like competition or government procurement where they didn't want more rules. So actually, perhaps it's a good thing um, in some respects that we haven't had a deal um, that could have been very unbalanced. Right? So that's kind of the question to put on the table there. Um, so I don't want to undermine the idea that what Trump is doing now is not problematic. It absolutely um, is. And we're seeing serious threats to the global trading system. And we have to recognize the, the value that the global trading system brings us. So we do, it does by having the WTO's dispute settlement mechanism. It avoids a retaliatory trade war. Right? None of us want a huge trade war uh, between the U.S. and China. We want to uphold a rules-based system that prevents us going sort of into a, a spiral of beggar thy neighbor retaliation. So I'm all for that. I think it's an important thing. Um, and I think the threats from the Trump administration are deeply worrying. If you've seen at the minute, there's a, there's a um, concerted attempt to block the reappointment of judges to the appellate panel um, and sort of disembowel <coughs> parts of the, the system there. So uh, that's, that's worrying. Um, and I think with Brexit as well, we can see the economic losses that occur when we withdraw from a, uh, a trade agreement that's, um, that's deep. Um, so that's, that's there, and there's certainly gains to be had from trade and from cooperation, and I don't in any way want to suggest otherwise. But, and here's the but, um, so we're currently seeing a huge backlash against trade uh, agreements. We've seen it in, the, we've seen it in TTIP, um, I think TPP. We've seen a lot of people on the streets. Um, and I think the, the issue there is we really have to think about why is that happening, what, we, what do we need to do about it. Um, and the response from the sort of pro-trade, um, and I think perhaps naively pro-trade group, or, um, is that we really need to think about redistribution within countries. So trade in itself is always a good thing, and what we fail to do is... Uh, redistribute within countries, so from the winners from trade to the, to the losers. Um, and there's ab that's absolutely vital. If we think about within the UK, we have a very, very deep regional inequalities. So in the, in the north of England, we've, we have a very low levels of productivity and the gains really from globalization and trade have accrued to the southeast. So there's absolutely a need to compensate, to have labor, um, to have training programs, particularly along, uh, among low-skilled workers, and to improve the quality of jobs that we have 
um, in, I think, the OECD countries at the, at the lowest skill level. But I think there's some really more important questions that we need to ask ourselves, which is what is in the, de the fine print of a lot of the trade agreements that we've had on the table recently. And there I think we have to look at, for example, um, in the TPP, we have to really scrutinize some of those regulations and ask, well, are they generating value, and if so, for whom? Right, so the TPP, one, some of the provisions in there on patents were to extend the terms of those patents, which I think there's not anyone who's sort of analyzed that with any depth. I'm thinking recent work of Stiglitz and Rodericks and others who've spoken out against the, the patents. It was really a redistribution to the big pharmaceutical companies and away from public citizens because it would have increased the price of medicines. Right, so there were certain very problematic clauses in uh, many of the agreements that we have. A second point, so there, there's a kind of question of which, which, what cooperation for what and for whom, and what are those rules that we are harmonizing around. The second point is then the question about, well, do we always want to harmonize? Right? If we think now between the EU and the US, we have very different preferences, actually, as societies on genetically more, uh, modified organisms, or in this country on chlorine-washed chicken and hormone-fed beef, which are the two big issues if we have a trade deal with the US that keep coming up. Well, maybe that's fine. Maybe actually we don't need to have harmonized regulations in those areas. There's always gains from harmonization, which are really about efficiency gains, but maybe those are not worth, the, the gains are not outweighing the loss of having preferences that are genuinely different, and actually by harmonizing towards a common set of regulations, we're, up, we're, sort of, we're losing other important public policy uh, values. So I think, again, we really need to ask about um, wh why are we doing the cooperation. And the third point, then, is to think about where we haven't cooperated, because I think there are areas in trade agreements that are incredibly weak. Labor standards is a perennial one, um, environmental standards, and actually that's a lot of the backlash, in, certainly in Germany and other countries, against TPP, sorry, against TTIP, was precisely around these, these issue areas. And then actually perhaps we do need stronger standards, and that's where I think we should be having a, a discussion now. Um, so I think it does come, and I wanted to ask you as the author, here about the analogy of gridlock, because I can see it works. The traffic jam analogy works to a point, I think. But then the redistributive consequences and some of these normative, big normative questions, whether actually because we sort of, cooperation is implicitly always seen as a, a good thing, whether the analogy sort of got you boxed into a little bit of a, a problem uh, there. And then I'm actually going to finally ask uh, the question you asked me. Answer the question you asked me, Calypso. What do we do about it? How do we get beyond where we're at in trade, even if I don't think it's really a question of, of, of gridlock per se? Um, but how do we get to a sort of global trading system that everybody would be um, perhaps happier with and would um, deepen and pursue uh, public policy goals um, to a greater extent? And there, I think there are what, five points here. One is that we do need to preserve the dispute settlement mechanism, the WTO. I'm absolutely clear on that, and I think the current threat to it is deeply problematic. So there is clear public good gain from the WTO as it stands that needs to be held, uh, upheld, and we need to, to preserve that, because I think retaliatory beggar thy neighbor trade um, war would not be in anyone's interest at all. Then there's the question of internal redistribution, right? And I think the consensus, again, is that we absolutely need to focus on that. The OECD is doing a lot of really important work in that area, and the UK and the US are perhaps the countries that have been uh, doing that redistribution worse than any other OECD countries. But then I think we need to take the foot off the gas, actually, on trade. I don't think we want to be seeing more trade agreements. One qualification to that is, I think, some of the low-income countries could do with more trade agreements among themselves. So I think in Africa, for example, the East African community has done a huge amount to integrate, um, and that has spurred um, regional integration and growth. West Africa has kind of got stuck, and now I think the grid lock analogy works, and we'd like to see more negotiation. Um, but in general, I think we should have the foot off the gas. I don't think we should be pushing more for more mega regional, certainly not of this type we've seen recently. Instead, I think we should be trying to restore our faith in the global economic governance system more broadly. And there, I think we need to have more cooperation in areas like tax right? and in competition. So at the moment, we have a really have a lack of disciplines in areas like tax um, and, uh, and competition. So that might be two chapters that aren't addressed in the book, but could be in future. And then, then so the fifth point is then, perhaps for your next book as well, maybe you have two new books, um, but it's to join up across issue areas a little bit more. So trade and climate... Um, again, thinking about really what does cooperation look like and deep, proper cooperation that realizes environmental sustainability plus the economic mm. uh, gains. So sort of thoughts about bringing these silos a little bit more into conversation with each other. Mm. Well, thank you, Emily. And Tom, I'm not going to give you the opportunity to answer right away. 
because I suspect that uh, our next speakers, Fola Shade and Maria, are going to have something to say about normative issues. I may, I may be wrong, but uh, so gather up the response, I'll, and, and then we'll, we'll come back to this. So Fola Shade, can I turn to you then? I mean, indeed, Emily has kind of pushed back a bit against the, the whole kind of um, assumption of the book that somehow, A, the gridlock is always bad, and here is what we can do. Um, and, and indeed, at the end of the book, you also speak about the rise of nationalism and populism as, as really a kind of the pathologies of the expressions of the kind of things Emily is talking about. People on the ground are not really always very happy with the results of this global governance. And yes, we can label this populism and nationalism, but maybe maybe that's in itself a problem. So we'll come back to this, but then what happens in development finance um, in, this, in, this, in this regard? Well, in the case of development finance, um, I would say that some parts of the argument also apply to that. Um, let's say whether we call it development corporation or ODA, um, it's, its governance is rather broad, it's fragmented. Uh, there are lots of institutional rivalries and normative competition that also reflect north-south competition. And so let's say that in this case gridlock is, there are three, I would say, manifestations of gridlock. The first one is the inability to agree. There's a variety of governance uh, arrangements. Um, let's say three group of actors, the, int the international financial institution, the World Bank and the IMF, who in the early 60s were, um, let's say, in charge of implementing the structural adjustment programs, and we know what it has uh, created in most of the developing countries. The second set of actors, the OECD DAC, that is a body of, norm let's say, mostly European uh, countries, uh, and traditional donors, and a third set of actors that are the developing countries, among which the, mainly the rising powers, China, India, Brazil, South Africa. And so in that context, the second manifestation uh, of gridlock is the multipolarity that you mentioned, and uh, different interests that arise in the contestation of some of these institutions, especially the OECD DAC, as being the main body of normative decision around development cooperation. Um, and this, let's say that China, India, Brazil, uh, and also South Africa, but also Turkey and Indonesia have really tried to delegitimize the DAC by bringing development cooperation discussions in the United Nations that is considered more inclusive. Uh, and uh, in the United Nations is the, De the Development Cooperation Forum, the DCF, considered as more inclusive and also more um, representative. So there's this, let's say, this move of delegitimization and relegitimization of uh, several institutions. And so this happens also in a context where, in terms of development cooperation, there's a, lot, a set of different actors beyond the states. It's not only about development agencies anymore, um, state-owned enterprises, you know, in the case of China especially, uh, are also in charge of executing several projects, NGOs, public-private partnerships, so the line is blurred. Um, in terms of, let's say, what have been the attempts to move through and beyond gridlock? I think in the case of development cooperation, those moves have been, um, let's say, parallel. So they have happened at the same time. Uh, f and they are uh, incremental and happen both from the institutions that show uh, readaptation, but also the <coughs> agents, the actors themselves. So a first attempt uh, to move beyond gridlock uh, was, let's say, well, the organizations and institutions try to form coalitions around common goals. That is the manifestation is the global partnership for development, for effective development cooperation. That was an idea initiated by the OECD DAC um, to bring also the UNDP on board and all the several emerging countries. Um, but it has not been very successful 
because many of these emerging countries have considered that the OECD is a bit too engaged. So they've, let's say they've engaged themselves technically, but not politically. Uh, so that has been a step to move beyond, like a direct step. But on the parallel track, there have been several, let's say, incremental steps to move through. And that is, uh, for instance, by creating some China DAC study groups, where Chinese uh, actors, internal actors, would be invited to um, participate in some DAC reviews. So it's a form of socialization to uh, DAC norms. Um, also, Brazil has been, one of the results is that Brazil has adapted some of the norms in terms of ownership, uh, but also uh, good practices. But there has been also a reverse socialization in practice, uh, where the OECD DAC members, individually, have also started to rethink what is development cooperation and the place of infrastructure, for instance. And the, China is putting lots of infrastructure in its development cooperation and engagement with recipient countries. Um, so many countries have been pushing the DAC to enlarge its definition of development cooperation. And that those discussions are uh, still um, ongoing. So um, I would say that I won't, I don't think that in the case of development cooperation, there's a, a gridlock. There are several attempts, um, but I think they move. It's, it's very incremental, it's, and it's led by different actors. But it's the state actors, also non-state actors, think tanks, for instance, and the institutions themselves. Thank you for that, Shade. And, and actually, Shade has uh, <laughs> mentioned several times China, which seems to be a really important actor in, in, the story, in the development story and shaking things up, which kind of reminds us that in the gridlock and beyond gridlock books, you know, one of the interesting conceptual twists is that they have factors which are factors of gridlock, so including multipolarity, more and more states, it's quite a mess, but then the same fact of more states emerging becomes a potential a source of a pathway because, well, here's a state, China, that shakes, shakes things up and wants to, is a, wants to put its own stamp on the way in which we do global governance. So it'll be interesting later on among ourselves, but also as we open up to, for the other areas to say something about how new actors like China, but also the BRICS, I mean, how do they change the norms, the power configurations in global governance, or how important are they in your different fields, as, as Fawashade was just saying. But last but not least, Maria, in terms of investment law and investor dispute, which is kind of an area you think was quite obscure, you know, only lawyers understand these articles, but it's become one of the flagships of the anti-globalization, anti-TTIP, CETA. So it's quite an issue that's out there in the public domain, really. And please tell us more. Gridlock, beyond gridlock? Let me first just summarize the investment chapter that is in the book, Contestation and Fragmentation by St. John. And then I will offer my own reflections on the topic. So the investment chapter uh, says that investment governance is indeed characterized by gridlock because there is a harder problem with the uh, regulatory expropriations. There is fragmentation that has higher transaction costs, inefficient division of labor, and excessive flexibility. And there is multipolarity, the contributor to gridlock. But the, the chapter also describes five pathways through and beyond gridlock. One of them is due to the shift of major powers' interests combined with the convergence on the common principles. And here is where the examples are with the mega regional treaties like the TPP or the TTIP. There's also the indication of the autonomous and adaptive international organizations, and the example is given with UNTAC and how it's acting as an investment policy hub, and the technical groups, and the example given is with UNCITRA. But there's also mention of the role of civil society in it, and NGOs, and how civil society actually participated in rebalancing these rules. The chapter concludes, however, that Investment governance is not balanced and it's not multilateral. 
and that the reforming the whole system will require thousands of renegotiations instead of one large one. Now, let us reflect on this. Um, why? Because the whole criticism to the investment framework is in regard to the enforcement mechanism. So it's in particular, the investor state dispute settlement mechanism. And we have exit the main international arbitration institution in charge of solving investor state disputes. Over its existence of 30 years of practice, of course the mechanisms have confronted with criticisms, complaints, and, and pushes of reform. But I think a key role is how the institutional, uh, the, the institutional reaction to these problems came about. Exit to all these complaints, for example, against the lack of transparency or lack of participation, did reform its rules. In 2006, uh, apart from having the public awards, it's already allowed for public hearings, and it also allowed amicus curious reports, so third-party interventions. But for all other actors, for example, developing countries or NGOs or even the EU, these reforms were not enough. So what happened? These actors are shifting their focus to another multilateral forum. And the second most widely arbitration rules that are used in these areas is the UNCITRAL arbitration rules. So with no wonder, they went to UNCITRAL to seek more reforms. But the book and was forum shopping, or what, <laughs> what we know as, yeah. Yeah, but there, it, it is exactly the, how they reacted is what differed. UNCITRAL immediately enacted, for example, in terms of transparency, it enacted the UNCITRAL transparency rules in 2014, which has to be applied to all investor state arbitrations. And then they, of course, had the problem of all the existing BITs that were there. But they devised a mechanism, one multilateral convention by which all, invest, uh, all the transparency provision would retroactively apply to all the existing BITs. So in this way, already adapting the provisions of BITs in regard to transparency provision. But then what is interesting to note is that in 2016, the UNCITRA Secretariat already recommended to the Commission that this exact same mechanism, which is, uh, which is found in the Mauritius Convention, should be applied to reform and adapt the investor state dispute settlement mechanism in all BITs. So with no wonder this already was proposed and it was a key topic in the last uh, annual Congress of, of UNCITRAL this year. And it has the support of a lot of countries. And just in September 2017, uh, we have the <coughs> EU, who is already, the Commission is already asking for the EU Council decision to authorize the opening of negotiations for a multilateral investment court. So in conclusion, what I want to say is with this latest development, what they are showing us is the strength of multilateral cooperation to actually fix and reform those rules that were established and were deficient through, uh, through bilateral mechanisms. So what we can interpret from this is that, yes, it can be challenging, there can be more struggle, but there is some progress at the end. And this is just part of the evolution of any system. So in, in, in order to put it into the terminology of the book, indeed, this area is a case that goes way beyond the gridlock. Thank you. Right. Well, thank you, and thank you for all of you for a very, very insightful and specific contribution. And, and so before we open up, I just want to turn back to Tom, our editor, who is going to show us the, the light. And in, in, in really listening to this presentation, we seem to hear that um, there is actually a lot happening incrementally. Uh, Fashade was talking in, in the area of development, some actors coming in the picture, New forums get invented, new, um, new principles, especially transparency, become important. Uh, but at the, so in some areas, but in others, less so, cyber trade. Now, how do you know, how do you decide when the gridlock is a real problem, 
and when it might actually be okay or even better because if there wasn't gridlock, maybe the most powerful states, principles that we don't necessarily like would be pushed. So how do you, dis how do you deal with this variance? And, and in doing so, perhaps say something about Emily's very important kind of normative question uh, in the trade area, but yeah. tell us. Well, thank you all for these uh, insights. I'm eager to hear what the rest of the room thinks about these questions as well. But I think that's a really uh, critical point. In the introduction to the book, what we collectively, all of the authors involved, tried to think about was um, exactly this normative question. So is cooperation valuable, and if so, for whom? And as political scientists, uh, people thinking about the world we live in, of course there's no solution that's going to be win-win um, for every single person. Maybe there's a few, but um, they're likely quite rare in the world that we live in. Um, and so we certainly want to separate the idea that it, it can be simultaneously true that we need cooperation for the world we live in, because we live in a world where what I do affects what you do, and what you do affects what I do. And we, if we don't manage that, we'll, we'll get ourselves into a very deep mess. But at the same time, the arrangements that we come up with to solve that kind of interdependence may indeed privilege me over you. And in fact, because we live in a world of power politics, it, it almost certainly will um, in some ways. And I think the trade case really shows that um, more sharply than maybe some others, where the, the nature is slightly less um, uh, distributional. Um, in that sense. Um, and what we, uh, so the point we really want to make is that unless we have systems, political systems, uh, governance systems, for managing this kind of interdependence effectively, we're going to get into the world where gridlock begets further gridlock, precisely because it's not sustainable. Um, and the trade uh, example shows that well. Um, so if we had a virtuous cycle in the post-war period, roughly speaking, of course, with the, not everyone thought it was virtuous, but a, ver a kind of um, self-reinforcing system of interdependence and institutionalization, um, we now are at risk of having a cycle of self-reinforcing gridlock, where actually the very failure to manage globalization well, the very failure to address global issues, um, does real harm to real people in real places, um, say, for example, with the unmanaged migration crisis, with the unmanaged uh, nature of the financial crisis in 2008. Um, and that real harm, uh, of course, people affected by the negative sides of globalization turn against it, creates political conditions under which leaders um, espousing uh, the idea of taking back control are more likely to come to power. They then take actions that make, it, make further global cooperation even harder and therefore set the, the gridlock cycle into motion again. And so that self-reinforcing dynamic where a failure to manage globalization creates a backlash against globalization, it makes it harder to manage globalization, which creates more damage, which creates more backlash, is, I think, where we risk going if we don't get a handle on these things and why the pathways and the, the ideas of uh, the more um, politically sustainable version of, of global governance is so essential. But... Um, well, indeed, and I, I do want to say that, you know, you might think, whoa, all these issues, it's, 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 there's a lot going on, but I, I do want to indicate that in the introduction to this wonderful book, you have a great table which summarizes all the issues and all the pathways and puts it all together for you. So it, it is a very also pedagogical instrument, very useful. I mean, I would say personally that um, in one chapter we didn't talk about, an issue we haven't talked about here, but is in the book, is nuclear proliferation, the, the issue of nuclear yeah. weapons. And, um, and that issue, I would suggest, but maybe not only that issue, um, where really you have, as many of you know, in July 2017, 122 countries signed the, a new nuclear prohibition treaty, of really banning nuclear weapons, and people kind of shrug their shoulders and say, well, yeah, but none of the nuclear weapon states are, have signed this damn treaty on banning nuclear weapons, so it's all too easy to do it if you don't have the nuclear weapons. But part of that story has to do with you know, what, what they call in the book transformative change. So there's there, a lot of the conversation has to do with incremental change, but we could collectively ask, you know, what will it take, what does it take to bring about transformative change where indeed these power configurations can be kind of channeled in directions that make the whole system more sustainable because more legitimate for people on the ground. And in the case of, of uh, the nuclear weapons, the whole idea is to change the norm, to say just like chemicals, just like m mines, 
this is now prohibited. You don't have states that have the right, God-given right to have nuclear weapons and those who don't, but we're trying to change the norms. And maybe it won't make a damn difference in the short term, but it could be transformative in the long term. And, or maybe that's naive, we don't know. But I think it's a question to put also, is, is whether we should feel, be content with incremental change. Yeah. Maybe we should, because we're realistic. Well, um, and, and it's also one of the pathways in the book about uh, coalitions of civil society groups mm -hmm. and reformist states. Um, and this actually is the same case that Maria is mentioning in the context of investment law, where um, big changes can happen. If we think back to uh, some of the biggest successes of global governance in the 1990s, things like the International Criminal Court or the campaign to ban landmines, or um, the Women's Conference in Beijing in 1995, it, or the Responsibility to Protect, these things all came about through um, civil society and certain states working together in a kind of inside-outside strategy to create really new norms, and ones that are contested, but ultimately perhaps transformational. Right, well, you've heard a lot, so we want to open to your comments and questions, examples. Some, many of you in this room have experience in international cooperation, so please raise your hand and say your name and where, which institution you're from. Um, yeah, there's a microphone in the back. So, oh, two microphones, actually. So, please, here. We'll maybe take two or three. Yeah. Hi, I, I'm Danny. I'm a doctoral student at uh, DPIR. And uh, my question is about um, the evenness of cooperation. And I, I think the most interesting thing that we were talking about here was the distinction between the answer on trade, where competition is, seems to be all too easy in a way, uh, or we want to slow down or cooperation, and some of the other subject areas where we thought cooperation was more challenging because it was constraining rather than liberating. Do you think that that is a, uh, a good model for looking at why uh, part of the reason when we talked about uh, at the very beginning um, a, a uh, crisis, uh, you know, a, uh, we talked about um, cooperation as a victim of its own success, that we have not had even cooperation. We don't have even cooperation on labor standards and environmental standards, but we have had relatively uh, advanced cooperation in terms of uh, globalizing uh, trade, for example. Uh, do we think that we ought to be thinking about these in terms of more even layers and that may help unlock some of the cooperation issues? Thank you. Leveling, yes. Sorry. Thank you. Jose Maria, the third college student from BSG. Um, I'm, I'm, I, I would assume that we could probably trace uh, other moments of gridlock in at least 20th century history. Um, and I, I just sort of picturing uh, the 19, late 70s, 1980s, uh, um, a, a whole concern for traditional international organizations not delivering um, to the sort of call of reforms from, um, from developing countries, from many forms of crisis that were happening in Latin America or uh, Africa, from decolonization, from uh, inadequate financial management, um, and many other issues from, uh, arising also from, from, from Asia. Um, it would seem to me that there's a new generation of organizational forms that were created internationally in the early 90s sort of to overcome this, 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 uh, this particular historical gridlock. Are we seeing or should we see a new, like truly novel organizational forms that we might see across uh, areas uh, emerging? Um, and and I, I think of this um, considering that we saw a replication of uh, these club forms or these uh, stirring, uh, stirring committees type of arrangements not in one particular issue, but across issues, right? So are we seeing this, uh, or should we see some sort of organizational novelty coming from this uh, particular historical gridlock? Shall we take these two for the moment and let everyone think about their questions? Would you like, Maria? <laughs> 
Yeah, I can start with the last question. I think the if it were to be created the multilateral investment court, that was that is going to be a, a great novelty because at least in the area of investment, it was during the, the 70s where this provision, you had United Nations General Assembly resolutions on investment that were really balanced for uh, developing countries as well, especially supported by, by uh, Latin American countries at that time. And instead, they chose to, to to, to have a framework established bilateral, by bilateral treaties in which these provisions that were at the multilateral level were not taken into account. What is interesting to see in this area in investment governance is that it's turning around again and we're yet going back to a multilateral uh, governance. And if we have a multilateral investment court, that's something completely novel. It's going to be established for the first time, but we, don't yet know, but countries, NGOs, activists, they're all working on it, and it could be something new. And just to pick up on that point, I think we do absolutely see these new institutional forms arising in response to gridlock. And if you think about an area like um, financial crisis management, so um, when the International Monetary Fund was created, it really required one country and a few of its closest allies to get together and say, we'll have this kind of critical lender of last resort for the global system. But in the 1970s and 80s, that uh, was increasingly under question. And indeed, in the 1990s, um, it became very clear that that kind of system was insufficient to handle the world we lived in. And so we saw the creation of the G20 in the first instance as a finance minister's network to respond to the East Asian financial crisis in the late 1990s. That then provided the basis for the G20 as we know it today, which is a leader's network um, of, of countries. And, and indeed, um, the expansion of the, G, of the um, say, the G1 plus in the late 1940s to the G7 to the G20 shows exactly this multipolarity trend. Um, the difficulty, of course, is that the G20 is not, uh, does not have a massive bank account like the IMF does and can't say, here's the check. They have to work at it. And that, um, is an example of how the increasing success of, multi, of globalization through multipolarity creates new problems. What the uh, chapter on this in the book by, I should say, a former global leader fellow here at the Bonnet School, Camilla Duran, um, who's now at the University of Sao Paulo, uh, writes so well is that um, that kind of fragmentation has now become um, slightly less problematic because one of the pathways through gridlock is how the IMF is um, playing a better kind of coordinating role, bringing the various bilateral uh, swap arrangements and the various regional credit swap arrangements um, into a common framework. And so it's not a multilateral solution, um, but it's a pathway to deal with and manage the fragmentation that's emerged and hopefully will be a more functional one um, and one that's happened through this evolution. And the leveling question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I also Good actually question. wanted to address this question because I think it's a very so good not forget and Dan's important question. one. Uh, in terms of organizational novelties and innovations? Well, I can think of two, at least, are relevant ones in uh, my domain of concerns. Uh, well, one uh, concerns the importance of those non-traditional actors like the large technology companies. Uh, the international, well, institutional structure is quite rigid in terms of what kinds of actors are able to participate in it. Right. So if you look at, I mean, obvious examples like Security Council or at a regional level, the NATO Council. So, uh, and, that's, and that's a real problem, right, because these are highly relevant actors, right, the technology firms. And uh, the problem really begins at the uh, phase of technological design and creation. And we see this problem repeatedly. So when, when the in, uh, internet protocols were designed in the 1970s and 80s, right, that was a small community of largely scientific researchers, people like Vince Cerf, right, who largely knew and trusted each other. Right? So there was no prioritization of the authentication of data packets uh, or the authentication of the senders right, of uh, internet communications. Uh, and then, fast forward to the 1990s when the internet became a broad social phenomenon, you arrive at a situation in which those internet protocols became uh, essentially established unalterable facts. Right? Ask any engineer and, and, and he or she will tell you that, well, 
anything can be re-engineered, but just do you have the money to pay for it? Right. So we're stuck with these, uh, from a security standpoint, poorly designed protocols from the 1970s and 80s that are very difficult to change, largely because of the absence right, of, of security considerations from a national governmental perspective uh, in the design of the protocols in the 70s and 80s. And I see a similar problem uh, uh, repeating itself in the advent of social media. So when social media was created by Facebook in 2004, I mean, who would have said right, that only about a decade later uh, terrorist groups would use that medium and other social media uh, platforms to not only finance and recruit terrorist operations, but also to direct them right, to issue activation orders or tactical orders right, from as far away as Syria? Into, if you consider some of the uh, actions that happened uh, over the last few years here in Western Europe. So, uh, and that, to me, reveals a similar problem, right, of uh, what happens when you don't involve, right? So, in a way, this is, these examples uh, illustrate the reverse of the problem, when you don't have, right, security considerations built into the process of technological design. And then once the technologies become broadly established, then the problems for governance is, well, those governance structures don't have the technology companies that design the technologies in the first place uh, deeply involved in that process. So I see, I see uh, major uh, problems in, in that regard. But then, and then secondly, then very briefly, uh, another institutional reform has to do with the laws of armed conflict. And here I'm uh, referring to the problem of unpeace, as I called it. So if you look at the NATO treaty, right, uh, Article 5 on collective defense explicitly states that uh, for that ob uh, collective defense, defense obligation to uh, kick into action, there has to be an armed attack. Right. Uh, and so we're locked into this legal structure where, as an alliance, we can only really meaningfully act in the uh, uh, case of an unequivocal armed attack, something like 9-11, right? And after 9-11 was the only time in NATO's history, right, that Article 5 was involved so far. And so why not reform the NATO treaty? Mm -hmm. So that you lower the bar of collective yeah. defense to encompass right, the uh, highly damaging activities, um, such as we saw again last year in the, in, in the United States uh, and, and elsewhere. So uh, I think we have, we have real trouble with our, with our doctrines and with our um, legal playbooks. And we've inherited them from um, an earlier era. And now the forms of harm that are possible and that are enabled by new technologies right, are difficult to deal with because uh, of, that, of the uh, uh, obsolescence of certain rules in those playbooks. <clears throat> Emily. Yeah, I wanted to come back on Danny's point, because I think, yes, I think there is an unevenness in how far cooperation has gone, and I think if we had more cooperation in some areas, it would sort of restore legitimacy in the system. So I think, for example, the tax one, I think, is a huge loophole, where we don't have sufficient tax uh, cooperation. But I think there's an underlying, there's a deeper question underlying it, which I think is about who is empowered in the decision-making process. So it's less, about, I think, about issue areas as thinking about who, whose voice prevails. And I think all too often we've had systems of governance that where we've had some voices or some countries dominate and some actors, often larger corporations, to a greater extent than individuals. We were just talking about um, in the invest, international investment arbitration system a few weeks back. And if you're a community that, for example, a mining company, international mining company has sort of polluted the water in your area, you've got no recourse to international mechanisms. But the company, if it's expropriated by the government of that country, does. Right? So we've got a real imbalance in terms of the, the power that actors have within the system, within different issue areas. So I think there's a question about how far cooperation has gone in each issue area and, what, and the unevenness that sort of creates problems across issue areas. But within each issue area, I think it's a question as well about voice and actors. <coughs> Is it kind of similar for Ashadeh? It's in, kind of similar, to, I think. To, to answer both questions, sometimes organizational novelty um, coming from gridlock is a matter of survival for some institutions. Um, in the case of the OECD DAC, it's also a way of 
let's say, remaining on top of the game because most of these other governance arrangements have quite delegitimized its procedures. And so one of the, uh, to give just one example, uh, there's been a push from the OECD DAC to um, promote trilateral cooperation, and that is between an OECD DAC member, a rising power, and a recipient country, or an international institution. And so they have been really trying to push for that type of um, cooperation in order to bridge the different divides among the rising powers and, and, and the, uh, the DAC members and the recipient countries. So does that necessarily create even cooperation? I would not think, so. I don't think so. Um, because where does that leave the recipient countries um, who are often, well, let's say so far they've been largely rule takers, but it's interesting to see in practice how they have exercised a certain type of agency by playing different games and using some of the, um, let's say the, benefits they could have from each of these sets of actors to their own advantage. And that's especially the case uh, in African countries where they've, they really subtly and uh, strategically know how to play the China game, I would say, vis-a-vis -vis the traditional donors game and take as many finance as possible. So in some ways, they'd, they'd rather not too much cooperation at the global level if, they, if it gives them more leeway, the, well, they one day it's better to, to have these countries work with us, other, uh, uh, other actors. Yes, well, yeah. there's the institutional game, I would say, the, where the norms are set, and in practice, on the field, what happens. And yes, there's sometimes a difference between the two. Because I think that's also interesting for your third book, because we're now working on the third book. And you have my chapter it's a, already. It's a series. <laughs> Just like on Netflix, that's what we should tr start to do as academics. So there is this question of decentering the gaze. How does it look like for, from recipient countries, from countries that are on the receiving end of the investment, uh, asymmetric investment dispute power? Uh, Etc., and and kind of decentering in that sense. And I think it's all a, a matter of perspective too, because if you are um, a world established power that you're used to establishing the rules, then having more voices and interest in the table, yes, of course, for that particular established power, that would be a gridlock, a problem. But think about from the perspective of developing countries or least developing countries, that is actually, that table is generating a capability for them. They are actually managing to give a voice there, have an interest that has to be taken into account. So if we compare it to, to, to a, dem a democracy, will we say that when we have protests, <coughs> is that actually undermining democracy? No. So um, I think having this multipolarity is also a kind of fueling the evolution of every system rather than holding no, Absolutely, and that's why we see you know, multipolarity is in almost every way a good thing. But it does make uh, the world is better because of multipolarity, but it's simultaneously true, right, that uh, empire was a very efficient way of global governance. Everyone had to do the same thing if you had a, a hegemon or an imperial power make you do it. Um, and no one thinks we should have that. No one, we all celebrate the end of those um, systems um, and should work to remove the existing ones that prevent them. Um, but we need systems that can then deliver on the cooperation and coordination that we need, or else we'll, we'll risk sliding further into the gridlock. And of course, the China issue that you brought up before um, put, uh, crystallizes that dilemma very well. Um, you know, we see a lot of. Um, rhetoric from the top levels of the Chinese government now on leadership and global governance, on defense of the multilateral trading system, on defense of the Paris Agreement on climate change, on a whole range of issues. Um, and I think the world would certainly be a better place um, if every country in the world, and China, first amongst them, would uh, take an active role in, in promoting good, good policy at the global level. Um, it's early days. We'll see on the variation across issue areas and within different parts of the Chinese system will, of course, be huge. Uh, if we think about climate change on one hand, South China Sea on the other hand, trade on one hand, uh, human rights on the other hand, there's going to be a discussion on all of these things. Um, but there is also in that um, 
change, this is, I think, your point, Maria, the, uh, an impetus that can be worked with to make progress. And that's really the main argument we're trying to talk about in the book, is what are these specific contexts and pathways we can work with. And of course, what's fascinating is that China moved from uh, a critique, uh, very reluctant to be involved, to a custodian of a system of global governance that wasn't created by it and in which it stepped kind of late in the game. But uh, we're slowly coming to a close. But before we do, I, 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 we still have a few minutes to take one or two more questions. So let me, uh, well, now we have more. So let me take a range of new questions, and then we'll have a quick word for everyone. Yes, here, and then here, and in the back. Um, thanks. Uh, Ye Jin, a uh, doctoral student here at the school. A uh, question for Professor Hale, and perhaps for the rest of the panel. You, uh, if I understood it correctly, you mentioned uh, a coalition of civil society groups as one of the solutions to this type of gridlock that we see. Uh, but I wonder, what about how do you transpire this sort of coalition in countries uh, that are characterized by strong state and weak society? Because when I think of, I don't want to paint an overly, overly simplistic picture, but if you think about a lot of East Asian countries, including China, like there, there's a plethora of civil society institutions working on these issues, but I'm not sure if they have a genuinely have a strong voice or influence in the policy decision making process. So how do we then enable those sort of bottom up pathway um, to solution that, that you mentioned? Yes, hi, Sam Vickers Death from ECI and CDK and the Climate Development Knowledge Network. In, in a way, my comment builds on that. Emily, you talked about crossover between the issue areas, and I wonder whether, in, in the course of the book, Tom and colleagues, you've sort of uncovered some issue areas drawing on experiences for other, for, from others. So, for example, the, the rise of non state actors as part of the solution in the climate space. Do we see that as happening or, or having a potential in, in other issue areas? And then the two in the back over there. Yeah. Hi, I'm Michael Wolfson, um, MPhil and economics student here at Oxford. My question is about regional integration as opposed to global. Um, do you see it as a stepping stone to, to <coughs> global integration for, across all these different specific issues, or do you see it as more just a, another la layer of complexity, that some, something that makes things harder in general? Uh, hi, I'm a master's student uh, from geography uh, department. Uh, my question is related to, um, so you talked about innovation before. Um, how um, can we kind of intertwine innovation with policy? Because normally we're thinking about innovation, uh, which is kind of um, created by policy and regulation. But can we think about innovation as a way also to trigger policy making, especially in developing countries when, where we have uh, kind of more fluid um, environments? Um, and if so, how? Do you think that the private sector uh, can have a role in this, talking about also non-state actors? And if so, how can international organizations, for example, help in this? The OECD, the World Bank, and all like uh, actors involved? Thank you. Did you have a hand up? No. Sorry. Okay. So I think we have oh, one last one last one there, and then we'll. Thank you for the talk. Um, my question has to do with. Um, Can you say your name, please? Uh, sorry, my name is Nalyanga Emasiku, and I'm doing an I'm doing the MPP here at Blavatnik School. So Emily had mentioned that um, one of the things that we might want to do in globalization is improve the tax regimes in a way that that um, improves glo globalization, rather. Um, so my question is, there are many reasons why countries use different tax regimes and why they implement different taxes. It could be because they want to, to protect their sectors. It could be because they want more money and all the like. So how do we, what recommendations would you put out there in a way for countries to implement this globalized tax regime that improves countries across the globe. Now that we have the Paradise Papers. Right, so I'm going to go reverse order, Tom at the end, and I, please choose one or two points because we're running out of time, so a bullet point each, starting with Maria. Um, I think I will go for the regional integration <laughs> question. 
So, yes, I think if you see China and what it's doing with the OBOR initiative and the same thing happening in South America with Brazil's initiative left that is called the Infrastructure in Initiative for the whole South American region, there are state interests behind that. So, and I think in the end there are competing against um, US or European initiatives in the same sense. So in that sense, I do think it will create a more complex situation because you will have to analyze uh, each one of them and what public goods are you getting out of it. But I do think it's possible to see exactly because you can determine what public goods you, you, you derive from this in seeing how, for example, their regional counterparts are affected by those initiatives and strategies, you can assess uh, which one will be better than the other one. Thank you. Well, I mean, very briefly to under, I won't put, a, put it as regional versus uh, global. You know, I think it's, th th these are several steps. Um, Bringing it to the context of um, on the African continent, there have been also many shifts. Uh, regional cooperation was seen in the first place as a means to protect against globalization, and that was especially after the independence years. Now it's more as a means to get better, a better insertion into the globalization process. Of course, there are several, let's say, there are several variations. As uh, Emily pointed out, East Africa is much more uh, let's say integrated than uh, other parts like uh, than Central Africa, but there have been several steps. I think it's most of the policymakers are really seeing it as a way, you know, to get uh, you know, tax barriers um, off, uh, visas off, and well, and it's also better, I would say, for trade and growth. And that's On the uh, question of civil society groups. It's important to understand that for some governments, uh, such groups are a threat to their interests. Right? So if you are the Chinese or the Russian government and you're seeking to impose greater uh, cyber sovereignty, as the Chinese call it, in order to uh, achieve greater information control over your domestic <coughs> cyberspace, then you're probably not going to want to involve civil society groups into your domestic internet governance structure. Right? So the kinds of groups that we perceive here in the West as uh, important and necessary right, to discussions about the governance of the internet may be regarded by countries like those as, as threats, and that, that's an important point to, uh, of divergence to consider. Uh, on the question of the private actors and innovation, uh, I, I want to approach it this in the following way. Uh, in terms of thinking about how to achieve uh, greater adaptation or adaptability to new technologies in uh, political leadership and political organization, uh, what's easier? Training politicians and policymakers in the intricacies of new technologies or turning technologists into politicians. My sense is that the latter <laughs> is easier. So this isn't an endorsement of Mark Zuckerberg for a president <laughs> in 2020, or it could very easily turn into that. Right? Uh, but I think this is, this is, this is a, it, there's, it's a real, it's a real question, and it's an important question. And uh, it reminds me of, in an anecdote that uh, Thomas Ilves, until not long ago, the president of Estonia, who understands computer technology very well, um, he, he once said how a, a head of state of a Mediterranean country that he wouldn't name, although I know which one it is, uh, promised him, promised Thomas, that uh, his email would never be hacked. Why? Because he doesn't use email. Now, I'm not sure that that's an auspicious statement right, when it comes to uh, that uh, in particular head of state's understanding of uh, computer technology. So I think there's a, real, there's a real problem in terms of educating right, political 
Yeah, it's putting your head in the sand. These technologies. So maybe which the thing we, to do which, is right is to is to start. I mean, it, uh, is for the technology developers themselves to become more interested and involved in the um, uh, in, in government and, and uh, politics. So perhaps Vatnik, the school has an important role to play in that regard. Applications open are uh, open now. So yeah. <laughs> all the technologists should apply. Exactly. Certainly at the Center for Technology and Global Affairs at DPIR, we want to <laughs> we try right to there. facilitate that. You have that. plenty of farm to yes. shop from in Oxford. We look very hard at this yeah. worst application. You have a reasonable chance, not. <laughs> To be involved, yeah. and their interest matters equally as any other actor in the system. So, yeah. Yeah. so I'm going to come back on the, the civil society question, um, so I, and I'd like to broaden it to think about trade unions, small and medium-sized enterprises. I think it's a deeper question of how do we democratise, and which sectors are more um, open to democratisation than others and more active. And the finance chapter is really interesting in that because your author there just notes the dearth of civil society organisations on financial regulation. So we have the great, great the global financial crisis and really very little engagement from civil society. And the argument they make, and they've got a paper from 2016, I think, Pagliari and Young, is that the density and the, the complexity of the issues and the dis debate really affects to the extent to which civil society gets engaged. So they're saying, you know, financial regulation becomes so complicated so fast, we don't have civil society involved, and then we, we really have a democratic deficit. So there's a, there's a real question in my mind about how we actually sort of resource and empower smaller players in spaces that are deeply um, complex. Because um, I think in quite a few of your chapters as well, there's this sort of idea that some of these technocratic professional networks are pushing forward, they're progressing in terms of creating agreements, but who's holding them to account, right? There's a real question there of progress being made, but how, what's the quality of the regulation, and is it in the public interest? Um, and I can come back on the tax one, I'll follow up bilaterally, but um, I wanted to follow up on the China one, because it's an interesting one at the moment in the trade space because there's been this big dispute, as you might well have been following, about China getting market economy status at the minute. Um, and the EU's just passed through new anti-dumping legislation that will basically enable it to, on paper, cement um, or uh, sort of build, rebuild relations with China vis-a-vis -vis the US. So it looks like we're going to have a two-pronged attack of the EU and China cooperating against the US um, in, to sort of uphold the multilateral trading system. Um, so it's a really interesting moment where China has suddenly become the partner of choice with the EU, uh, for the EU, uh, um, against the Trump administration. So we'll see how it plays out. Fascinating. Just on the civil society question, you know, the, the mechanism in the book is slightly more specific. It's about coalitions between civil society and reformist states. And the argument is that we've struggled to see examples of reform and global governance where you haven't had both the inside and the outside working together on that. And that's why, and, and the, uh, Kevin argues in the finance chapter, things like the Occupy Wall Street movement ultimately didn't lead to policy change at the level um, that might, you might have thought they would have done after such a big crisis because it didn't have this kind of um, policy traction that, that other successful cases in, in the past have. Um, but of course, it, uh, hypothetically, um, a more, and this is going back to the point about transformative change, an Occupy Wall Street that had um, the right kind of uh, reform agenda being pushed by countries and by experts inside the system could actually have a, an important way forward, and maybe this is the investment case that um, was mentioned. Um, I want to come back to this idea that, that Sam and the question on innovation raised um, about whether we're seeing learning across areas and whether this is getting any better. And I think, you know, our, as I said before, our original view in the book was the whole motivation for the first book was that there wasn't a lot of learning across things. In the academic world, we're more and more siloed into our own specialties. I think this is a part of the problem. But also in the policy world, um, people are siloed in their silos, in their micro, mini silos, sub silos within silos. And that makes it really hard to think about these systemic problems that we have. Um, and the argument, the premise of all this is that because there are systemic problems, there won't be solutions unless we are making those connections and innovating the ways that are, are thinking um, across them. So we are trying to do that a bit here, um, but I hope you'll all continue to join us in that process for the third, fourth, fifth, seventh, yeah, well, eighth. Indeed, <laughs> indeed, because, well, thank you, Tom, and, and indeed, I think you can agree with me that we've managed a feat in this uh, one book lounge, book conversation, to actually advertise and speak of three books. The, the mother book from which <laughs> Uh, the gridlock book from which Beyond Gridlock was, was inspired. And then the next book where we all of these issues, including the really hard, difficult ones and normative questions, this question of linkage and how do you make it happen, 
Um, and where do you stop? Um, all of these issues, well, thank God, are not all treated in the book, but I would like to really encourage everyone in the room to buy the book. It's really a very, very fascinating book with lots of examples and, and developments on an issue which, of course, you'll all agree is, is critical in our era, really a matter of survival, life and death for, for, for humanity, if we can put it in really grand terms. So for having produced this book, Tom, with all of your authors and for uh, all of our panels for having contributed to this conversation in your, each in your brilliant and different ways, I'd like to ask everyone in the room to join me in thanking all of you. Thank you. By the book. <laughs> and oh, yes. thank you. Reception. We'd love to invite you outside to uh, continue the discussion.